Hi everyone, good morning. A spirit-filled and meaningful Sunday to all of us. Praise God. And uh, I'd just like to thank the Lord for how he has sustained us throughout this uh, quarantine period. And uh, uh, by the way, we are going to celebrate our church's 11th anniversary on the last Sunday of this month, November 29. Our guest preacher is no other than the first resident pastor of GCF Northeast, Pastor Emmer Manoloto. So I pray that you will also pray with me as we prepare for this celebration and uh, for all the preparations that we are going to, to do. Thank you so much. And uh, how are you? I hope everyone in the family is in good health. Now, if there is anyone who is sick, I pray that God's healing touch will be upon you and his comfort will also be upon you. And kamusta po kung kayo po ay may karamdaman? No, maaring ito po ay sakit ng ulo or it is a chronic debilitating disease. And then someone approaches you and asks you, do you wish to get well? Gusto mo bang gumaling? Di po ba? How will you respond? Now, in our passage this morning, a man, a crippled man for 38 years, had an import, had important conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord asked him a strange question. Do you wish to get well? And his reply was not the obvious or what uh, might be all of us might not say. And that is recorded in our passage this morning in John chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. John chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Please read with me. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five portico, porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after st the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately, the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful story. And we pray now with the help of your spirit that we might profit from our time together and from our time in your word. Would you enable me? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, brethren, we come into a new section in the Gospel of John. And I've already mentioned before that John did not set out to record every single miracle of Jesus. 
As a matter of fact, in the last verse of the book, in John chapter 21, verse 25, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So instead of recording lots of Jesus' miracles, John only recorded a few and focused his gospel only on seven signs. We've already looked at two of them, both of which happened at Cana in Galilee. The first one was when Jesus Christ turned water into wine. And there were so many people who saw the miracle, but only the disciples believed because they believed his word. And then last week, we looked at the second sign where the Lord Jesus Christ healed a royal official's dying son. And here it affirms that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of distance. He's the Lord of time. He performed his miracle while he was in Cana and the dying boy was in Capernaum. And the, at the exact moment when Jesus said, the boy lives, your son lives, the boy was instantly, completely healed. And all the Galileans who were surrounding Jesus heard the same words as the nobleman. But the nobleman heard the word and believed the word and took the word of Christ to his whole household and they also believed Jesus. Two signs, two groups of believers. But the ones who believed did not believe because they saw the signs and wonders. They believed because of the word of Christ. And as I've said earlier, chapter 5 starts a new section of the book. Like the first section, it centers around two signs. A man was healed and a multitude was fed. But the results of, this si of these two signs were much different than the results of the two in the first section. Now, these two didn't result in much or clear belief. As a matter of fact, the result, they result in direct confrontation and opposition. And as you study the book of John or the Gospel of John, we see uh, progression. Each of the signs that John records doesn't bring more belief in Jesus Christ. It is really just the opposite. And with its sign, fewer, fewer people believe in Christ, and the opposition becomes more and more pronounced. To the point that later on, Jesus even asked if his disciples are going to leave him too. If, I've, if after reading and studying the Gospel of John, and you still think that God does miracles so that people will believe him, then you have to reread and restudy the book again. Because the book proves that the more miracles lost people see, the more excuses they will come up with. The with to uh, they will come up to reject the God of miracles. That's why Apostle Paul in Romans chapter ten seventeen says, "So faith comes from what seeing." Faith comes from what? Feeling? No. He says in Romans 10, 17, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And the whole book of John is really an exposition. You, you, you can say it that it is an exposition of that single verse. Because John consistently proves that faith doesn't come from seeing the miracles. But it is from hearing the word of God. Now, scholars debate about the man here in, pas in, in this passage. Uh, some say he was saved. Others say he was not. I've heard it preached and taught both ways. And most of the time, I've heard it preached that the man was saved. Now, the fact is that we can only go with what the text says. And the text doesn't ever indicate that he believed in who Jesus is that we see in verse 13. And because of that, and also because of the pattern of the gospel as a whole, I don't think that 
we can say he became a believer. And what a, tra a, a terrible tragedy that is. Imagine the boldness of taking in the wonderful blessings of the Lord and yet not acknowledge him as Lord and Savior of your life. This man who has been healed of a crippling disease for 38 years, a terrible affliction, still didn't trust Jesus. He didn't trust his whole life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's hard to imagine, is it not? Jesus, I'll let you do all kinds of good things to me. I'll trust you enough to heal me, but I will not trust you enough to serve you. I will not trust you enough to bow my knees to you. I will not trust enough to share the gospel, to tell others about you. I will not trust you enough to know you, to obey your commands. How tragic that is. Yet, my friends, that's not just the story of a man by the pool 2,000 years ago. It's the story of most people in the world. And I also, perhaps, say that it is also the story of most of us right now watching this online service. Now, let us review again. Go back to the story. In verses 1 to 4, we see the historical setting. Sometime after the events happened in Cana with the nobleman, Jesus made his journey back to Jerusalem. Verse 1 says that he made the journey because there was a feast in Jerusalem. Now, uh, we're not told what the feast was all about, but it, that is not important. Now, I think the Apostle John only wants us to understand that there were so many people in Jerusalem at that time. And you see, during the feast, faithful Jews from all over the region came to participate. And the streets were crowded, the temple was crowded, and every place was packed with people. And one of the places that was filled with people was the place in where in the passage it says it is called the Pool of Bethesda. Now, that name for the pool came from the Hebrew word which means a house of outpouring or the house of mercy. But to me, it's more of uh, a house of misery. Well, you see, it was a small gate near uh, on the northern side of ancient Jerusalem and uh, near, it's near the Sheep Gate. It was near the Sheep Gate. And you know what? Archaeologists have uncovered this ancient site in Jerusalem. Now, the Sheep Gate got, got its name as the place where the sacrificial lambs were brought on their way to the temple. But uh, near to the Sheep Gate were two pools fed by an underground spring. Now, on the peri periodic occasions, when the spring would cause the water to uh, bubble and steer, an urban legend had formed around that bubbling. Now, the superstition said that when the water steered, an angel was stepping in, in, the, wa stepping in the water. And the legend that said that whoever was the first, uh, first one in the pool would be healed by the angel. That we see in verse 4. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the, the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. But even though this was a local superstition, hundreds of people crowded the two pools to be healed. And it was likely that they had their own healing service in Jerusalem. There were so many people in those pools that the Romans built shelters. Our passage calls it porticos. And the best way to describe them is to compare them to gazebos or pavilions. And verse 3 says, Now in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. It tells us what kind of people were there. It wasn't a nice place. It was full of sick people. Mga bulag, pipe, bingi, mga pilay ang nandudoon. They were all paralyzed. Some were paralyzed. And they, as the passage says, they were withered up parts of their bodies. The young and the old, 
the women and men, children are all there because no one wants them around their house all day long. And what do you think? What would we smell? No? If, if you've ever been in a place where the dying and the sick spend a lot of time, perhaps you can relate to the smell around this pool. Imagine meron doon, kagaya na itong crippled man. Paano? San siya iihi? San siya dudumi? No? Napaka uh, pungent yung odor siguro. And what would we hear? Sounds of people crying in pain, crying in hunger, crying out for mercy. So, tignan po natin, no? isalarawan natin, sa isip natin, ito pong uh, pool na ito ng Bethesda. Hundreds of miserable people laying around in various states of physical, emotional, and mental despair. Hour after hour, day after day. No? And then, no, bigla silang makakarinig. No, gumagalaw na yung tubig. Andiyan na yung anghel. Just imagine, ay lampilan, daan-daan, maguunahan, mauna doon sa pool. Hindi po ba? Ang kanilang iniisip, paano nila mauunahan yung kanilang mga katabi kapag nakita na nila na gumalaw yung pool. All focus, no? makikita natin on me and my needs. And the man in our passage was no different except that he had been that way for 38 years. Na-imagine niyo po ba yung bitterness ng taong ito? No? Sa 38 taon, sa kaya, sapagkat ang focus niya, ang kanyang kagalingan, ang kanyang pag-asa ay nandoon sa tubig. Na kapag ito'y gumalaw, merong anghel. And just imagine, nung naririnig na, ang dyan ay anghel, paano siya makakagalaw? Gugulong siya? Wala naman tumutulong sa kanya? Tinutulak siya palayo. A blind man can walk, a deaf, a mute can walk, yung pilay sa kamay, they can walk, pero siya, hindi. Now, there is a strange question, no? And we see a divine healing in verses 5 to the first half of verse 9. And then Jesus came up to him. Of all the hundreds of people there, Jesus speak out. One man. Jesus could have spoken the word and all of those people could have been healed. But he did not. No, hindi ko po alam kung inikutan ng ating Panginoong Jesus lahat yung limang shelters. Hindi ko rin alam kung uh, ilan po ang dinaanan ng ating Panginoong Jesus bago niya kinausap ito pong uh, pilay na tao. No? And notice ang tanong ng Panginoon sa taong ito na 38 years na may sakit. Do you wish to get well? Or do you want to be healed? Or do you want to be made whole? Jesus asked him a strange question. A man who was hopelessly crippled for 38 years. He was so desperate that he bought into the cruel local superstition. And what did Jesus ask him? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to get well? On the surface, it may be Ridiculous. A ridiculous question. No, parang nagtatanong ka sa isang gutom, gusto mo bang kumain? O para doon nagtatanong ka sa isang nauuhaw, gusto mo ba ng inumin? O nagtanong ka sa isang pulubi, gusto mo ba ng limos? Kung kayo po yun, meron kayong sakit. Mahaba na rin, long term, chronic yung inyong sakit. At kayo'y tinanong, gusto mo bang gumaling? You know, I can imagine what my response might be. Ano? Are you kidding me? Do I want to get well? Do I want to be made whole? Hindi. <laughs> Alam mo, nandito ako for fun. No? Kaya nandito, ayan, no? makikita mo, andyan yung mga barkada ko, mga imbalido, andyan si Peping Pilay, andyan si Bertong Bulag, andyan si Bong Bingi. Oh, lahat kami nag-enjoy. Ang ganda-ganda na itong place. Tatanungin mo ako, do you want to get, do you want to be healed? Do you wish to get well? And the man would notice, doesn't say what most of us would say. Are you kidding me? Of course. That's the obvious answer. I want to get well. Now, one thing you should notice about Jesus, he is always asking questions. But Jesus doesn't ask questions, my friends, because he doesn't know the answer. Jesus asks questions to make us think, to make people think. And when we begin to think, 
He reveals the true nature of our hearts. Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? And the man's heart is revealed by his reply. He said in, he said in verse 7, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. He seems to tell Jesus what he feels is the reason of his continued sickness or for his continued sickness. Those people, they won't put me into the pool. They, they, they even keep pushing me out of the way. It's not my fault that I am not already healed. It's their fault. He is bitter and he is blaming others for his pitiful condition. And so he did not answer Jesus' question. He, did not, he, does, he didn't say, I want to get well. He dismisses the question and even complains to Jesus of his condition. He, he, how unfortunate he is. He missed all of his troubles. No? He complained about his, his condition. And in today's language, we would say that he sees himself as a victim. He has this victim mentality. Are you a perpetual victim? Do you always see yourself as a victim, as a victim of society, as a victim of circumstances, as a victim of your upbringing? My friends, how can you tell if you or someone you know has that victim mentality? Allow me to share some uh, ways that we can know if we, are vic we have that victim mentality. Victims endlessly repeat how they have been mistreated. Second, victims live by the childish notion that life should always be fair. Victims find it difficult to forgive others because they see forgiveness is weakness. Victims have difficulty maintaining close relationships because they have difficulty trusting other people. The cry of the perpetual victim is, it is not my fault. Therefore, he plays the blame game. And the tendency to blame others is well ingrained in our human nature. Blaming others is often nothing more than a subtle twisting of the truth in order to relieve us of the, pres of the pressure of ourselves. Relieve the pressure of ourselves. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, my friends, without the deep working of the grace of God, you know, we will do exactly what our great folks, Adam and Eve, did. You know, they started the blame game. I want you to notice also, again, that the focus of the man for his cure was the water. Getting into the water first was his hope, even though it was only rumors. It was only a rumor or superstition. No, na-imagine niyo po ba? Lahat nandudoon ng mga tao na may sakit. Biglang pagsigaw, andyan yung anghel, naguunahan. Sino? Sa tingin niyo, mano nila malalaman kung sino nandudoon doon sa Paul? Most likely, my friends, no one ever got healed. But when you are in a hopeless, helpless, desperate situation, you are likely to try anything. That's human nature. And people still do that today. Don't they? Marami pa rin naniniwala sa mga pamahiin. Hindi po ba? Takot sa itim na pusa. Naniniwala pa rin sa swerte at malas sa, puso, sa pusang kumakaway para mag, uh, nag, 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 nagtatawag ng swerte. Marami po naniniwala pa rin sa mga uh, pamahiin. So what did Jesus say to him in verse 8? Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. No, it's just like Jesus saying, you rise, you take up your bed, you walk. This is, this is not about blaming things on other people. This is about you doing what Jesus commands you to do. The man who was invalid, crippled for 38 years, who couldn't walk, was now told to do three things. You rise, take up your mat, and walk. I don't know about you. My friends, but if I had been unable to use my legs for 38 years, I may have some doubts if I still have the ability to even stand, let alone to walk. 
Di po ba, pag may nagsabi sa akin, ako ay invalido for 38 years, tumayo ka, nagawa ko na yan, sinubo ko na yan, ilang beses, hindi nga ako makatayo eh, nakita mo nga, oh, ito ako, 38 years na akong ganito. Di ba? But in effect, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you can, because I say so. And he did, in verse 9, immediately the man became well, and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now, it was the Sabbath, on that day, he was immediately made whole. 38 years of debilitating sickness were gone. He was made physically new and whole. At kanyang ginawa, kanya pong nirol yung kanya mat, parahil ay tinak niya under his arm, and he did something that he hadn't done for 38 years. He walked. No? Siguro sa akin pong pananaw, hindi lang siya naglakad, maaaring po siyang palundag-lundag. Patalon-talon, patakbo-takbo. And now, what is the aftermath of the healing in verses 9, uh, half of verse 9 to verse 15? So the story gets really interesting. Now again, no, the sin, no, the Lord Jesus Christ asked him to walk. So he started working, his ma the mat uh, packed under his arm. Then suddenly a group of people becomes interested in him. The Jews, the passage says, and probably they were Pharisees, the expert church guys of the day. See that guy is doing work on a Sabbath day. And that's a big no-no to the Pharisees. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath. And it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Anong ginagawa mo? Hindi nagbabawal yan. Hindi man lang nila napansin na itong lalaking ito na pilay for 38 years ay nakakalakad na. Put the thing down. Yan pag, pag, pagdala mo ng mat na yan. No, the man, my friends, no, he was put in a bind. Who was he, who was he going to listen to? The ones who had done nothing to help carry him into the pool or the one who has healed him who told him, pick up your mat and walk. Now, I want you to notice a very subtle thing about what the man said. My friends, because it is one evidence that even though his body was better, he had not changed his inside or he hasn't changed on the inside when jesus asked him remember if he wanted to be healed what was his answer he told jesus the reason he wasn't healed because people other people didn't do the right thing they were not helping him to be in the pool now when the jews accuse him of doing breaking the law on the law of Sabbath, he pointed his finger of blame again to another person. It's not my fault. The man who had healed me told me to do this. You see, there was no change of heart. When Jesus saves a person, his life will show it. He will show it in the way he loves God. He will show it in the way he loves other people. This man didn't change his heart. He continued to pass the blame on to other people. But you see, he had a problem because he didn't even know whom to pass the blame on to. Remember, he didn't even know who healed him. In verse 13, but the man who was healed did not know who it was. He did not know who it was who had healed him. But Jesus sought him and found him again in verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. This time when Jesus found him, he gave him a warning. Jesus said, You know the horrible physical condition you were in? You are going to find yourself in a whole lot worse condition than that if you continue living your life of sin. Notice the emphasis on verse 14. You have become well. You are made whole. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse 
happens to you. Not anybody else. No finger pointing here. No blaming here. You cannot blame your parents. You cannot blame your culture or your society. You cannot blame your school. You cannot blame your job. You cannot blame anybody else. You are responsible. If you continue in your life of sin, you will be far worse off than a mere physical sickness. Mas malala ka pa pag nagpatuloy ka sa iyong kasalanan, sa iyong buhay na makasalanan. Mas malala pa yan kesa sa iyong physical na kondisyon. And at that point, what should the man have done? He should have pleaded for grace and mercy to God. He should have seen his inability to do anything about sin, about his sin. He should have asked for forgiveness about his selfishness and pride. He should have asked Jesus to save him from his sin. But he did not. What did he do in verse 15? The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. He left. He found the Jews and told them about Jesus. Now, many people have mistakenly thought that this was witnessing, but it was not. In fact, if you see verse 16, for this reason, they were persecuting the Jews. They were persecuting Jesus more. Napahamak lalo ang Panginoon. That day by the pool of Bethesda, Jesus performed a miracle. Now, there are three ways to view this miracle. One was the way of the one who was healed. And here you would think that he would fall flat on his face and trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he did not. He disregarded Jesus. He walked off without even thanking the Lord Jesus Christ. Without even acknowledging for what Jesus has done to him. The miracle did not affect his heart. Inside, he was the exact same lost and selfish person he had ever been. My friends, is that you this morning? Just the fact that you are alive today at this very moment watching this online service testifies to the fact that Jesus has performed many miracles in your life. Have you changed? Have you changed? Have you bowed your knees to him in service and obedience? To him. Or you have simply received his grace and mercy and kept on walking. Have you allowed him to fix you on the outside while not allowing him to fix, to have you, to have your inside as well? May I repeat that? Have you allowed him to fix your outside without allowing him to have your inside as well. That another way to view this miracle was how the Jews viewed it. They completely discredited the miracle. They ignored it. They refused to see the absolute wonder of what had happened right in front of them. What did they do? Instead, they stayed all wrapped up in their system. They stayed focused on their day-to-day -day legal system. They refused to acknowledge the miracle because it did not fit with their worldview. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you refuse to believe that miracles still happen today. Maybe you refuse to believe that Jesus changes lives and changes hearts. Maybe you are just too wrapped up in your day-to-day -day life to see the work of God around you. Can you see 
how petty that is. Can you see how petty your schedules, your habits, your routines, as compared to the miraculous hand of God, to the powerful God? How could these Jews be concerned about a man who was carrying his mat around when he had just been healed of a terrible affliction? The same way, brothers and sisters in Christ and my friends, you can be so wrapped up in your little personal systems and refuse to see the miracle of salvation that Jesus has provided for you. The healed man disregarded Jesus. The Jews discredited him. But there is one more view of the miracle that happened that day. And that's the view that is presented in our text. The view that worships Jesus. The view that worships Jesus. The miracle that Jesus performed that day was something that only God can do. When you think about it, now think about it. Jesus recreated the man. He recreated the man's body. After 38 years of not using his muscles, perhaps the muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments had already atrophied. Hindi na nag-grow. Kaya namayat ng namayat na yun. Nothing was capable of working and essentially, the man's body was dead. But Jesus completely recreated it. New muscles, new bones, new ligaments, new joints, new tendons, nothing gradual or partial, nothing took time. Jesus spoke and there was a new creation. The oldest passed away. Behold, all things became new. Not only did Jesus recreate the man's body, he redirected his will. Jesus told him to do something that he was incapable of doing. Jesus said, rise up, take up your mat, and walk. And when Jesus told him to do the impossible, he did. Jesus recreated the man's body. He redirected his will. And you know what? He reiterated his standard. When Jesus sought the man out the second time, Jesus told him what he required of him. Jesus said, don't sin. Basically, he told him the same thing that he was telling, he tells us in Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect. My friends, do you know that Jesus is telling you the same thing this morning? That is his standard. And his standard never changes. Jesus commands you to be perfect. To be holy. But you and I both know that is impossible. It is impossible, my friends, as it, as it was, for Jesus to command the crippled man to rise and walk. We do not have the capability to live perfect lives, to live perfect, holy lives. It is impossible. But you know what? Jesus specializes in the impossible. If you will just submit your life to him as your savior and a savior and lord of your life, he will recreate you. He will cleanse your sin with his blood. He will cover you with his righteousness so that his perfection will be yours. All you have to do, my friends, is to allow him to redirect your will this morning. And Jesus is telling you to do something that you are incapable of doing. He is telling you to rise, take up your cross, and follow him. And if you do, you will immediately, he will immediately make you whole in him. He will immediately make you whole in him. Will you allow Jesus to make you whole this morning. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we, we thank you.
for this brief time that we've had to look into your word. Your word indeed is powerful. Your spirit is powerful. Lord, we pray that your spirit would work this word deep into our hearts and minds in the coming days and weeks. And that we would be people who would cry out, we want to be healed. We pray, Holy Spirit, transform us and mold us and shape us more and more into the image of Christ. For his sake, we ask, amen and amen.